With the heroic assistance of Space Marines from the Red Scorpions chapter, Marshal Kagori had achieved a successful breakthrough of the Curtain Wall. During the assault on the breach, the Red Scorpions had suffered more casualties than they had bargained for, and so they had departed Vrax in order to restore their chapter to its full strength. But despite their recent victory, the 88th Imperial Siege Army was unwittingly on the cusp of horrific annihilation. The prolonged conflict on Vrax had now truly caught the attention and interests of the Dark Gods, particularly that of Nurgle and Khorne. The never-ending slaughter and misery on both sides was well to debased God's appetites. With their cursed patronage, the war was ready to devolve to the next stage of debauchery, and so their minions continued nudging the war ever towards the edge of total apocalypse. The daily death toll of both Krieg Guardsmen and Vraxian militia forces was providing a more than adequate blood sacrifice required to open a warp portal. Once the dark rituals to create an entrance from the Immaterium had been completed, it wouldn't be long before the world would be overrun by hordes of demons. The 88th Imperial Siege Army would stand no chance against such demonic incursion. But little did Marshal Kagori nor his command staff suspect that Vrax had become an altar of slaughter. They couldn't have known, for any knowledge of Chaos's true nature was strictly classified information that was heavily suppressed in the wider Imperium. The fact that the world was now on the brink of a large-scale demonic incursion remained unknown to anyone but the most highly ranked Inquisitors. The supposed Inquisitorial authority over Vrax was in the hands of Lord Inquisitor Hector Rex. As a highly ranked member of the Ordo Malleus and Proctor General of the Scarus Enclave, it was ultimately his responsibility to monitor and lay waste to all traces of demonic taint in the sector. As a powerful and properly trained psyker, privy to the true nature of demons, he was well equipped for the task at hand. Ever since the arrival of Chaos Space Marines on Vrax, he had kept an eye on the situation, judging the right moment to intervene should things get out of hand. Scarus' close proximity to the Eye of Terror and the persisting Chaos threat emanating from it meant he was a busy man. At all times he had his work cut out for him. Frankly, the war on Vrax had already spun out of control. Now he would have to work overtime to salvage the situation before it was too late. It was well due for the Inquisitorial troops to reinforce Vrax, but even an Inquisitor as mighty as Hector Rex himself is not beyond the jurisdiction of his own organization. As usual in the Imperium, troops are always spread too thin for commanders to simply act on their own accord. Before sending Inquisitorial reinforcements to Vrax, he would have to make an appeal before the Conclave of Scarus. The great and powerful Inquisitors of the Skyra Sector would come together and counsel for a session with many different items on the agenda, ranging from the usual accusations of blasphemy to full-blown heresy. After all, deciding on the consequential targets for assassination by the Officio Assassinorum is a delicate matter. It had once been the assassination of the renegade Cardinal Zephan himself that had been discussed during just such a session. And as the present Inquisitors were all painfully aware of, the outcome of that particular decision was one of the main causes for the pressing matter that they would now have to deal with. During the meeting, Lord Hector was seeking the Conclave's approval of his plans with Thrax. He had plenty of convincing evidence for the impending demon incursion. Of course, a prolonged siege with a frighteningly high death toll wasn't something out of the ordinary for the Imperium. But by this point, Alpha Legionnaires had spent almost a decade on the planet whispering in the ear of the Cardinal as advisors. A demonic beacon had lured further traitorous reinforcements to the planet, including even more traitorous starties. By now, Vrax's population of several million souls had all been converted into deeply committed Chaos worshippers. The Eastern Front had turned into Nurgle-infested swamplands, where worrying reports of supernatural creatures lurking within the green fog spooked the Krieg Guardsmen. Clearly, it wouldn't be long until real demons of the warp found their way into the material universe en masse. Such malevolent spirits could not be defeated by conventional means of warfare. There were only a few forces in the Imperium able to repel such a foe. In his eternal wisdom, the Emperor of Mankind had endowed the Ordo Malleus with just the right troops to deal with such a threat. The Grey Knights, also known as Demon Hunters. 
Lord Hector X wished to deploy this mighty force on Vrux. Furthermore, he planned to incorporate the entirety of the 88th Siege Army under his own command structure. Lesser Inquisitors in his entourage would take over the role of officers, accompanied by their own companies of Tempestus Scions. This would make sure any demonic threats could be swiftly dealt with. This was a risky proposal. Any agent of the Imperium seeking too much power for themselves falls under tight scrutiny. Anything less than the Council's unequivocal backing could hurt his standing within the Inquisition. Should Hector X fail in his mission to save Vrux, he would most certainly invite accusations of incompetence. His failures would be read as blasphemous signs, and direct rivals envious of his position as Proctor General may even accuse him of more heinous intentions. Especially the Order Hereticus was always on the lookout to indict anyone failing in their service to the Emperor. After their own failure in assassinating the Cardinal, they had looked for ways to shift the blame. If Hector X presented himself as a scapegoat, they would certainly take it. Their organization lobbied for the Ecclesiarchy to take control of the Militarum forces on Vrax instead. Surely the battle on the Shrine World was a holy war. After all, it was home to the Basilica of St. Leonis the Blind, and an important place of pilgrimage. Not only was the Cardinal's heresy an inherently religious matter, their very own Sacred Order's militant, the Sisters of Battle, had been killed and imprisoned on Vrux. Through the burning light of the Emperor's most devoted followers, Vrux would be cleansed of heretics and mutants. Clearly, this affair should be dealt with by only the most zealous of the Emperor's servants, implying they deemed Hector Rex to fall short of such standard. But he would not back down from such indictments. He was a dutiful Inquisitor that had always performed his role as Proctor General with a stoic perseverance. Over his life he had grown into a man of fortitude, confident in his psychic talents and gene-enhanced physical prowess. Fortunately for X, many other Inquisitors agreed that he was the man for the job, and he could count on their support. Once all arguments for and against had been heard, the onerous meeting reached its conclusion. It all came down to a vote amongst all members, which turned in the Lord Inquisitor's favor by only a handful of votes. The margin had been small, but Hector X had acquired just enough approval for his plans to proceed. He would take the Inquisitorial forces to Vrax. Lord Hector X met with Marshal Kogori on Thracian Primaris to inform the commander that he was relieved of his duties. The 88th Imperial Siege Army would be fully transferred over to the 88th Inquisitorial Siege Army. He assured Kogori that the transfer of command was not due to any accusation of misconduct or incompetence on his part, and all his martial honors would remain intact. As far as the Inquisitor was concerned, the Marshal had prosecuted the war on Vrux with general success, and he could not be blamed for the demonic threat that lingered over the planet. Now Marshal Kogori was given a choice. Either he could subordinate himself to the Inquisitor and accept a new role, or he could resign and seek a new appointment on another frontier. Kogori had come to reinforce Vrux, dedicated to bring an Imperial victory. He would not abandon it now. Even if he could no longer do so as overall commander, he was dedicated to see it through to the very end. To his immense credit, he immediately requested transfer to the surface of Vrux itself, where he could content himself with the command of a single regiment. Should that not be possible, he would even settle for command of a company. This noble request was of course immediately granted, and together with his personal command staff, he deployed as a frontline commander. Despite the drastic transfer of power for the troops in the trenches, not all that much would change. The siege performed like a machine fueled by robust logistics. The artillery continued to rumble overhead as before. The attacks were met by counterattacks. Everyday troops fought and died for every inch of ground just like before. New reinforcements and weapons trickled in as usual. The difference was that more and more orders were delivered with the red wax seals of the Inquisition on them. The agents of the Ordo Malleus began to take their place in the ranks as officers. The first major tactical problem for the Lord Inquisitor and his newly unplaced command staff was obvious. One look at the strategic hollow map showed the crucial shortcomings of the Imperial lines. The eastern section of the front remained wide open. Because of this, the encirclement of the Citadel was incomplete. By this point in the siege, the Imperium would no longer satisfy itself with the Cardinal's surrender. The aim of the war was to completely eradicate the traitors. But attacking the Citadel now would be pointless if the heretical forces could simply withdraw and escape into the Vraxian hinterlands. Such a thing could not be allowed to happen. And so closing the ring was the primary objective. Lord Hector X would continue the campaign where Marshal Kogori's plans had stalled against the Plague Marines. It was time for the 30th Line Corps to move forward and complete their objective of meeting up with the southmost elements of the 34th Line Corps to complete the encirclement. 
Meanwhile, on their flank, the First Line Corps would push towards the curtain wall. The entire area had been turned into a toxic quagmire. The cloud of gas hanging over the swamps had not fully subsided yet. Fortunately for the Death Corps, the corrosive TP-3 had mostly seeped into the soil, but the unnatural green fog that hung over the battlefield remained. Visibility was drastically hindered. There was no doubt that the terrain would be pockmarked by shell craters and littered with the wreckage of destroyed vehicles and rotting corpses. The brave troops of the 19th Regiment had fought and perished here during their rearguard action, when the Chaos reinforcements threatened to outflank the 88th Siege Army. The Plague Marines had settled in the area, but it was unlikely that they had constructed any serious defenses. In fact, it was uncertain if they were even still around, or had fallen back towards the Citadel. For good measure, the assault was kicked off by a preliminary bombardment nonetheless. Thousands of shells disappeared into the fog and exploded out of sight. When the bombardment ended, the Death Corps troops climbed up on the ladders and out of their trenches into the green hellscape. Considering the inhospitable terrain, the initial progress was as good as could be hoped for. Soon, enemy artillery began to rain down upon the advancing troops. Under normal conditions, getting caught out in the open by an artillery barrage was a death sentence. But due to the poor visibility, enemy accuracy was very poor. The 30th Line Corps marched on. But the enemy had not completely run out of their TP-3 stockpiles just yet. Amongst the bombardment, several shells released the deadly gas. The acidic gas clouds were soon billowing across the 263rd Regiment's front. Squads that stumbled into thick concentrations of TP-3 were quickly wiped out. Progress was slowing down because by now, the infantry found themselves getting sucked knee-deep into the mud. Many troops began reporting painful sensations on their feet. The toxic sludge had perforated their boots and started melting the flesh from their bones. In some of the worst areas, soldiers had both their legs practically completely dissolved. Only a handful of these horribly maimed troops managed to crawl their way back towards their own lines. Many poor souls perished to a horrible fate as their bodies sank helplessly into the deadly mud. Clearly, marching the entire line corps through the swamp on foot would prove too costly. But with any luck, the vehicles of the 8th Assault Corps would be able to make it through. Their thick steel armor would be able to stand up to the corrosion, keeping the crew inside safe from harm. Equipped with robust powered air filtration units, the tanks and armored personnel carriers continued on their way. Visibility was reduced to just a few meters. Tanks were becoming bogged down as they blundered into large shell craters or tank traps. Nonetheless, large groups of vehicles were making it through. Surely guided by the Emperor's divine protection, they steadily rumbled on. Then, through the green haze, the first enemy activity was spotted. Plague Marines had rallied the Vraxian defenders and their armored vehicles had driven into the swamps towards the Imperial forces. Upon contact, both sides fired blindly into one another. Only at point-blank range were the gunners able to see what they were even shooting at. Their aim was mostly guided by the glow of tracer munitions bouncing off armor and indicating the location of any enemy vehicle hidden in the fog. In the midst of the quagmire, the assault was halted. Reports came in of hordes of enemy infantry advancing upon the tanks, but how is this possible? Even the hardy Death Corps infantry themselves hadn't been able to march this far into the swamps without crippling casualties. To their surprise, the Vraxian militia forces on foot seemed to suffer no such attrition. Upon hearing these reports, the newly appointed inquisitorial officers sanctioned the use of their own chemical weapons against them. Surely the poorly equipped Vraxian troops wouldn't be able to stand up to an overwhelming amount of corrosive gas dumped on their heads. It would only be suitable to give them a taste of their own medicine. But the Death Corps troops had already learned their lesson in the year prior and absolutely refused to deploy any more poison gas of their own. Certainly not on the Eastern Front, where the landscape had already been turned into a toxic soup, completely uninhabitable for at least several centuries to come. This proved to be a wise decision, for they would soon find out the approaching enemy forces were no ordinary militia forces, they were plague zombies. Due to some arcane means, their bodies had risen from the dead. Under the patronage of the Dark God Nurgle, any troops that had been swallowed up by the swamp now emerged. The rotten corpses of Vraxian and Death Corps troops alike formed a horde of the undead. When the eastern defense line had been abandoned, many thousands of Vraxian defenders had taken their chances and marched through the swamps in an attempt to escape the encirclement. None had made it back to the Citadel. Instead, every single one had succumbed to the gas or gotten sucked into the mud. Now, this bulk of troops made a valuable asset to the Nurgle Marines. The Kree gunners fired into the horde, but many who were cut down by a hail of bullets simply wouldn't stay dead. Mindless and unarmed, they kept coming and swarmed the tanks. 
The assault would not be able to continue until this mob was dealt with. Only absolute obliteration of these foul creatures would assure their bodies wouldn't rise again. But the tanks had not been properly equipped to deal with such a threat, and would eventually run out of munitions. Alas, then the regiments were now forced to march up on foot to support them regardless. Fortunately this time, the tanks advanced and already scouted out the safest ways through the swamps. And so the infantry of the 30th Line Corps re-attempted their perilous journey with varying success. Casualties were unsurprisingly high as the inhospitable swamp took its toll on the men. But within time enough, troops managed to reinforce the forward elements. Their flamers and grenades proved suitable weapons to deal with the plague zombies. Methodically, they began whittling down the undead horde to manageable numbers. Released of their burden, the tank operators could once again focus on dealing with the enemy vehicles. Slowly but surely, the assault regained its momentum. As they advanced further, the thick green fog hanging over the landscape began to clear up, and the troops knew they had almost pushed through. It had been a hellish battle, not necessarily because of the enemy resistance, but because the Eastern Front had become by far the most hazardous landscape on the entire planet. Now they had successfully traversed it and come to the other side of the swamp. The irony of being ordered to march through this hell of their own making had not escaped them. During the final stages of the 30th Line Corps' advance, the enemy was pushed back beyond the curtain wall. The 263rd Regiment met up with the most southern elements of the 34th Line Corps, and the encirclement was finally complete. The 1st and 46th Line Corps had continued their own push towards the curtain wall, and captured an important strategic location called Hill 202. This high ground provided a commanding overview of the entire citadel and would prove priceless for the artillery spotters in assisting their gunners. Now the countless Earthshakers were able to pound the Vraxian lines with great precision from all sides. Several defense laser stations were captured in the process, further reducing the Vraxian's ability to resist the Imperial's growing air superiority. Day and night marauder bombers of the Imperial Navy conducted bombing raids over the remaining enemy territories. The Citadel's strong void shield soaked up the worst of the punishment, but any areas with lesser shield coverage were forced to be abandoned or face obliteration. Under the overwhelming firepower, the Vraxian resolve was wavering. Cardinal Zaphon had settled in despair and essentially given up all hope at this point. He had once been a man of power and charisma, able to whip a crowd into a zealous frenzy with nothing but his words. But years of horrific war had turned him into a disillusioned, broken man, with a shadow of looming defeat hanging over his psyche. He had foolishly put his trust in the hands of Lord Arcos, whose chaos reinforcements had not been able to turn the tide. The various warbands did no longer recognize his authority and simply did as they pleased. Griefed with self-pity, he retreated into his personal chambers and left the defense of Rax to his commanders. But there were some amongst the defenders who would gladly rise to take his place. Second in command, Deacon Mamom, was of a stronger will than the Cardinal and not yet ready to resign himself to defeat. The Chaos Marines had not come to Vrax to see the war end without squeezing out every last bit of slaughter they could. In the absence of the Cardinal, various warband leaders hatched their schemes to take over command of all Vraxian forces. But no matter what trouble brewed within the Citadel walls, as commander of the 88th Inquisitorial Siege Army, Lord Inquisitor Hector Rex, could be content with his progress. His first goals on Vrax had been completed. The curtain wall was now completely surrounded, and the engineers were already busy preparing several underground mines to blow more breaches through it. His inquisitorial reinforcements had not even been needed to achieve it. His Tempesta scions were held in reserve, and the Grey Knights were still patiently stationed within their ship in lower orbit. With all line cores in place soon, the assault upon the Citadel itself could begin in earnest. Hector X allowed himself to be optimistic. Surely, the war would be over quickly.